College Place is a video library of noteworthy presentations, panel discussions, and lectures featuring guest speakers and faculty members taped at one of the Milwaukee Area Technical College's four southeastern Wisconsin campuses. These are produced by students in the college's associate's degree program in television and video production in coordination with Milwaukee Public Television. Um, we did our first one in 2008 in Madison. We came to Milwaukee in 2009 and we were looking for a place to have the conference and someone had suggested the Harley Museum. Um, so we talked with the folks at Harley for actually quite a while. They were really excited about hosting a, a major sustainability event. We were talking to about three or 400 people. Um, and it wasn't until, but, the, but late in the process, that we, we got a, a caution put up that Harley was just rolling out their sustainability program uh, to their employees and, and really sort of making it a centerpiece for what they were doing and where they were going as they, as they looked to the future. Um, so the, so the uh, I guess the plea to us was, we still want to do this, but we want to do it in the future. So I'm back, Matt, to, to have that conversation. Um, we'll be back in Milwaukee in, in 2012 in December, um, and we've actually already started having some of those conversations uh, with Matt's people. So um, Matt, uh, among many of his, of his many attributes, um, he's a motorcycle rider, and he, he's been riding since he was eight. And it says in his, his, uh, his CV here, he currently owns a 2010 CVO Electrica Glide Ultra Classic. I don't even know what that is, but I'm sure it's cool. So help me in, in welcoming Matt. Thanks, Tom, for that uh, great introduction. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, spot to be here uh, after listening to all these uh, talks, especially um, John's. You know, I could go in about six different directions. I've got to stay on point here because uh, we're pressed for time. But um, one of the things that uh, Sarah Graf prints on is uh, decals that go on Harley-Davidson motorcycles. So it's really uh, a very exciting to me to hear from John today. I had no idea what Sarah Graf had done and the, and the, the, the trail that they're uh, blazing and I'm proud to have them in our supply base. So, and we're very happy and delighted to be here. Um, it's a great honor for us. We appreciate all of you being here. I also uh, appreciate our team down in front, uh, very talented, very committed, very smart uh, folks that are leading our sustainability effort at Harley Davidson and we're very, much in the early stages, as Tom indicated, but we're very excited about uh, what, it rep what it represents for the company. And I think, you know, as a, as a well-known company and brand, you know, the name Harley-Davidson tends to conjure up in people's minds a lot of imagery and, and often a lot of passion. And I suspect, you know, for some of you in the room, you probably have things in your mind about what Harley-Davidson means to you, and, and maybe it's a an image of a beautifully styled or customized motorcycle. Maybe it's a, uh, uh, an image of our legendary logo. logo. Uh, maybe it's the sound of our distinctive rumble. Uh, maybe that distinctive rumble appeals to you and maybe it doesn't. Um, and I think some of you in the room, you know, may be wondering, you know, why is Harley Davidson here presenting as a part of this panel? And to help, you know, give you a sense of why, I want to give you a picture of what Harley-Davidson conjures up in my mind, what I see and what I seek out on my Harley-Davidson motorcycle. So I'm going to show a short video clip here, about a minute and a half, that's literally taken from the front of my Electroglide Classic motorcycle on a trip that I took for work. Uh, last August in uh, the western third of Oregon. Um, so if we could quickly roll that uh, video and uh, have a look.
So that was a little bit of a sense of my humor there. Um, it was literally gravel right up to certain death. Um, so, you know, I hope, you know, that gives you a sense maybe of a different perspective of why our environment is so important to Harley Davidson. It's what our customers seek out and what they gain most from their connection with our brand, which is freedom and escape and being out on the open road and seeing beautiful scenery. So it's escapes like this that fulfill the dreams of our customers for you know, our planet and, and for the environment, and it really matters uh, to them. So you know, more pointedly, you know, sustainability is critical to Harley-Davidson, and it's as critical to Harley-Davidson as it should be to every person everywhere. Uh, we have, you know, there's a whole host of reasons why you're all well aware of them. Certainly the planet and its limited resources, the societies and the communities in which we live and our duty uh, to those societies and communities, our customers and their passion for that escape and what they're looking for and what we uniquely provide. And for our company, our brand and our continued evolution. Uh, it's, it's about as important as it gets. And in fact, you know, our history as a company is full, is full of inflection points. And we're at one of those inflection points right now. A threshold of significant change and challenge when you look at some of the macro trends around population growth, uh, increasing um, social and economic status that brings with it consumption, increasing urbanization, and these things together are laddering up to be a significant uh, uh, amount of change for the world's uh, society. And, you know, increasingly, and maybe more than ever before, our future is going to be defined by the choices that we make today. Sustainability, in no uncertain terms, is an imperative, and it's an imperative for Harley-Davidson. It's integral to our thought, to our actions. It's a core part of our business strategy. We even have now a sustainability subcommittee of our board of directors, which is relatively uncommon uh, in public companies. And I sit in most of the committee meetings of the board of directors, and I can tell you that that's the only committee meeting that the other board members voluntarily come in and sit in on. They're highly engaged and interested in what this means to our company uh, going forward and what we're doing about it. So it's no longer good enough to be just a good corporate citizen. Uh, it's got to be much deeper and broader. So, so what does it mean to Harley Davidson? You know, our approach stems right from the core of who we are and is integral to everything we have to do as a company. Our industry is widely recognized as providing you know, an efficient means of recreational activity and in a lot of cases an efficient means of personal mobility. Uh, when you think about um, you know, the space conservation of a motorcycle and increasingly urban environments, the relatively less amount of material necessary uh, to produce a motorcycle versus something like a car, uh, the relatively more fuel efficient nature of a motorcycle versus other forms of transportation. Our customers view our products more as jewelry, as collectibles, not disposable. You're far more likely to see a Harley Davidson in a garage or even a museum than in a landfill or a scrap heap. There's an amazing amount of motorcycles that we've produced since the beginning of our existence that are still in existence and in many of which even still on the road. So our legacy as a company and our path forward is firmly grounded in the notion of preservation and renewal. The company's history is full of examples of this idea of preservation and renewal, other inflection points where new eras demanded new approaches, always with a keen sense of where we've been and where we need to go and how we need to adapt. So things like the two world wars where the company had to retool in support of wartime efforts. Uh, in the early 20s, when mass production and Henry Ford and so forth made a Model T about as expensive as a, as a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Uh, in the early 30s, in the Great Depression, when the company's volume of production went from the tens of thousands to literally the low hundreds and how the company had to adapt. In the 50s and in the 60s, 
uh, a threat of a lot of uh, offshore competition, first the British and then the Japanese, which carried through into the 70s and even the 80s. So a few examples of these inflection points in our past where we had to recognize what was going on around us, understand how we needed to adapt to those changes and circumstances, all the while knowing where we came from, what we uniquely and powerfully deliver as a brand, making sure we hang on to that in whatever transition is necessary for us. And we view this point in time, this threshold, this other inflection point today, uh, no differently. So um, if you um, talk a little bit about you know, preservation, uh, you know, it's notions like uh, from generation to generation, our brand and, and what our company stands for, some of the ideas of self-expression, independence, personal freedom, escape. These are values that have been a part of Harley-Davidson since its existence and transcend you know, cultures and countries around the world. Um, the product itself, uh, very honest, real, high integrity, real materials, timeless designs, built to last. The business model, always customer-led, fulfilling dreams for our customers and running a strong business so we earn the privilege to keep doing it. All the while, this renewal, how do we deal with what's coming toward us through you know, meaningful product enhancements, through you know, innovative approaches to marketing and talking to our customers, through uh, how the customers engage through our dealers around the world. What do we need to do to continue to you know, modernize, upscale, improve, and retool. Today, as I said, is another critical inflection point per those macro trends I talked about earlier, and how are we going to respond? So, you know, it, the, the general sort of approach is it's what we're all about as a company. Um, it's our purpose, what we stand for. Um, it's not just, you know, I think I, sorry, I, I missed a page here. Right, okay, this is important, sorry. You know, to understand our approach, you know, it's useful, you know, to maybe understand a little bit more about our history. I think many of you know it's a Milwaukee company founded in 1903, just about 30 blocks west of here. You know, four guys got together with a dream of a motorized two-wheel transport. The four of them had a specific role in the company, one responsible for product development, one responsible for manufacturing, one responsible for the dealer network, and one to run a strong company. They maintained their focus and their collaboration and their partnership and, and that steady hand of leadership and stewardship until the last of the four founders died uh, five decades after the company's founding. So for 50 years, there was that constancy of purpose, that clarity of what we stand for as a company. And it's that thread of, of understanding you know, our purpose and what we stand for that's this idea that has to carry forward in our efforts around preservation. So you know, we're unique and appreciated by millions of customers, and that carries with it an important duty to them, to our industry, to societies, and to the planet. It also has uh, for us a unique, creates for us a unique opportunity. The passion and the bond that our customers have for us and their desire to escape to beautiful places represents a terrific opportunity, again, around this notion of preservation and renewal. And this preservation and renewal concept here is represented uh, in the mission statement that we have for sustainability. We preserve and, re and we renew the freedom to ride. And you might think, well, that's a little bit self-serving. You know, that's good for Harley-Davidson. But in fact, it's good for all of us when you look at what it yields and what we're after and what works for us as a company and what works for us, for our customers, works for all of you, works for everyone. And that's what makes it um, extra powerful. So how do we translate this into our actions and to our choices and, to, and into our decisions? Well, it's the basics. You know, we've got to recognize the macro trends that I talked about. We've got to be committed to reducing our consumption, our waste, our emissions. And we have to be committed and understand that we must go well beyond mere environmental compliance. And I love some of the things that some of the folks here said today, 
around that point. There's a great conversation I overheard once about lean. And one guy said, geez, Joe, I didn't realize you were so green. And Joe said, I'm not green, I'm cheap. You know, they, they are so inextricably linked. You know, um, the, the economy reports to the planet, the planet reports to the economy, right? And, it, and it, it is, you can't separate them. And when you realize that, you see the power that comes from doing it all. Um, so those are the basics, and we have a slide of a number of things that we're doing, and I'm not going to spend any time on them, but if you look at them as I talk a bit more, you can see there's quite a bit of diversity in some of the projects that are helping our employees understand what sustainability means in a deeper level than maybe it's been talked about in the last, you know, five to ten years. There's a lot of great work, you know, going on uh, in the company. And there's also a lot of steps uh, and things that we're doing that you can't see. You know, we're investing uh, to fulfill our customer dreams in the coming low carbon economy. We're investing in game changing product enhancements and in business practices that leverage the power and the bond that we have with our customers to go deeper and farther than anyone expects. We're planting a lot of seeds, and none of them are really heroic by themselves. Many of them probably won't bear fruit immediately. The work is largely you know, invisible, but we think very significant. And collectively, we think it's gonna add up you know, to make a big difference. We're proud of our early progress. Uh, we've had a 40% reduction in greenhouse gases between 2004 and 2010. We only know the piece of our chain that we know and we appreciate that there's a whole chain before us and after us that we haven't yet uh, captured in those calculations. But these are early strides and early, uh, early progress. We've received awards for our facilities, one uh, being the museum that was built on Brownfield, utilizing the crushed roadbed from the Marquette Interchange as fill to take uh, soggy bottom you know, swamp land and make it suitable to put a building on. Um, we're unleashing, importantly, the passion, the community spirit and engagement of our 7,000 employees worldwide and recognizing the potential that our over 1,400 dealers, their employees, and our millions of riders have beyond that to take some of the ideas of sustainability even further. So we're on a journey, just like a great motorcycle ride, it's a journey of exploration, of discovery, of progress. I view it as an endless ride. To me, that's the best kind of ride. Um, we've got to learn, we've got to adjust, we've got to refine. We're at the very beginning, but we're looking for steady improvements. We're looking to set aggressive targets. We're looking to reset our goals when we have new information. And we're looking for breakout success where breakout success can occur. It's not a lot different than you know our history that began and our amazing journey that we started in 1903. This is just another important inflection point, one where we have to recognize where we've come from, what we stand for, and what we need to do as a company to renew ourselves uh, in this important juncture in, in the world's uh, history. So I thank you again for the opportunity to be here and uh, appreciate uh, the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Matt, and I think we've got plenty of time here for any Q&A, so if anybody's brave enough to come up to the microphones, uh, fire away. Hi, um, I'm Stephanie Miller, and I work for a company with multiple offices throughout the country of various sizes, and I'm a member of an employee group that's working to try to find ways that we can become more sustainable and all those uh, you know, green business practices and things like that. What we found is that it's been difficult to try to benchmark it because we are all doing our, our own day jobs at the same time and trying to you know, find ways within our individual roles to figure out what we can do to improve. Do any of you have any suggestions for ways to get that initial benchmarking and uh, you know, just any, any things that you've encountered in your, your own practices? Oh, 
Well, I would say just look at the meter. <laughs> I mean, if you're doing the right thing, you'll see a drop in your energy usage. I mean, that's going to be your most immediate um, feedback. I hate to be that simple on it, but uh, with your uh, parameters being so broad, I mean, you're not going to know until you actually take a good look at your meter. And, and something I've discovered in this business and something I never really knew is how to actually read one of those things. You should really pay close attention to your meter uh, or your utility bill when you get that. It's, it, it's really a, a fascinating document at times. It, it seems like voodoo how they come up with that final number and nobody ever questions it. They just write the check and it goes out the door because if you don't pay it, you know you're not going to have lights or heat or be able to turn on your computer. Question your meter, uh, your bill sometime and see you know exactly where all that, that money is going and why you're paying sometimes so much more than at other times. That's my only advice I, I've got. I don't have a big time answer, except we do a lot of benchmarking. We go out and look at best practices in other companies and then bring it back and, and try to adopt it at our company. But I, I agree that you know, every business is sort of unique. I mean, the printing business has different issues than the motorcycle business. And so you really need to look at just, just your, get your own baselines established and just go from there. Just try to improve on your own. Take your, you know, I know happen to know our power bill is 1.3 million a year, so we start there and look at our, the kilowatt hours you're using and try to knock it down. So I would think maybe just look internally first and, you know, if you get a chance, go out and benchmark again, go up to Orion and see what they're doing. Yeah, to add on to that, one thing to do is to always look to see what you do that actually provides value. And then ask yourself, how do I actually facilitate that value? What we find in a lot of our operations is that uh, a lot of times people want to jump right to efficiency projects. And we want to do these things because they're easy, we can see them, they're the, the lighting project, the compressed air projects. But usually what happens is we fail to ask ourselves that question of do we need the lights? Do we need the compressed air? Um, are these things that actually provide value to us? Uh, so begin by asking yourself, what do I do that provides value? And then secondly, what do I do that actually facilitates that value? And a great example of that is actually Xerox. You know, years and years ago, what was Xerox? Xerox was essentially the uh, uh, copy machine company. They made copy machines. Anybody know how many copy machines Xerox makes these days? I don't think they make any. They're a document company. They didn't get value by making equipment that made copies. They got value because they ultimately manage documents and they change the way they do that. The same thing applies with the, uh, to energy. You know, instead of looking to see, let's make our lights more efficient, maybe ask ourselves, do we need to have the lights in the first place? Things like the solar tubes are a good example of that. Get rid of that and then actually look at the next level. That is also a great way of engaging a lot of involvement in the uh, general employee base. And it, oh, I'm sorry, just one quick thing. On a more general level, what you're asking is, we don't have enough time to do our jobs as it is. How do we figure out how to do this other job as well? Um, and I would see this as a really important opportunity to think about something quite different, which is you realize it's difficult. Benchmarking, and certainly for decades now, there are very significant problems in the footnoting for benchmarking. This is something that's sort of the dirty little secret of the industry. Um, you want to make sure that your company is not simply bearing a proxy tax by pursuing green ratings or green sort of whatever it is. Benchmarking and understanding at very detailed level what is being claimed in those sorts of systems will help you a great deal to make sure that the business is not making decisions which are hidden costs and regulatory add-ons to your work. This is something that becomes very, very difficult in this area. Green rating systems often act as proxies, but they're proxies not for performance. And so you need to look deeply. I mean, for example, the ISO numbers, uh, international claims about this, and I, I know that you guys work on this. The more you know and understand the guts of it, the better. My name's Justin. I'm a student at Merrill Hurst University. Uh, this question is mostly directed uh, for Nikos. Um, do you see a future where GR, GRI reporting or, or sustainability reporting is required by the Dow Jones for its members? And um, do you see GRI reporting integrating with the financial statements? Uh, yes. Um, there are two questions here. I'm going to start from the first one. Already GRI reporting has been regulation in Europe in many countries has been already a regulation in many countries, and also in Asia as well. So it's, it's already happening. 
Um, I'm not sure if GRI is going to be the only standard in the future for reporting, but there is no question that together with the financial reporting, already there is a requirement for sustainability reporting at the same time, especially for public companies. This is, is not a trend, it is happening already. I don't consider any more a trend because it is happening and there are thousands of organizations that are doing that already globally. Uh, based on GRI standard or not based on GRI standard in any case, there is a particular movement right now for integrating reporting, which means financial and sustainability reporting at one report, um, from the big accounting companies, KPMG, Ernst & Young, and all these uh, guys with the uh, GRI and many other lobbies, and they will see how it's gone. Yeah. First, I want to make a quick announcement as, as chair of the summit. Um, we'll cut the questioning off now after this because we have to leave time for a break. And during the break, I encourage you once again to visit our exhibit hall but we have an outstanding series of sessions following immediately at 2 o'clock, including a plenary forum in this room on, on a subject that's very important to the Wisconsin economy, and that's biofuels, and specifically biogas. We have great potential. We have no uh, fossil fuels in the state of Wisconsin. We spend $18 billion a year importing energy from fossil fuels. If we could invest more of that in the state for alternatives, that would be great. And one of our greatest potentials is biofuels and biogas. So I encourage you to attend the forum in this room at 2 o'clock on biofuels and biogas. Um, there are also two other breakout sessions at 2 o'clock. Please consult your program. And then at uh, uh, 3.30, there is a series of, I think, four other breakout sessions, all of them excellent on more specific topics than these general sessions. And so please consult your uh, programs for those. Uh, as long as you're at the summit now, please stay and support and uh, attend these additional uh, sessions. It's very, very important uh, for your own education and also to support the summit, to show support for this great conference. I have three comments, uh, and I'll just ask for your uh, comment or your response. One is, I think, value assessment without a moral dimension is a two-dimensional robotic exercise and not uh, appropriate for human endeavor. <laughs> Secondly, as to supply and demand, a new product never has any demand. If we waited for demand for new products, we'd have no automobiles and no airplanes and virtually everything else that we enjoy in modern civilization. Third, The fossil fuel industry is the most profitable industry in the history of civilization. Do you think it has any influence on public policy? <laughs> um, do you think it has any influence on the fact that the taxpayers, you and I, are subsidizing this industry which makes hundreds of billions of dollars of profit each year? And we're not subsidizing alternatives. This makes for a very uneven playing field, which puts alternatives such as renewable energy at a disadvantage right from the start. And thirdly, these companies do not pay the costs of what is euphemistically called in the industry externalities. Externalities are the negative impacts of the use of these fuel sources, such as mercury and other heavy metals into the air from coal primarily, which have accumulated in the fish, for example, in Lake Michigan. Many of the big uh, top of the food chain fish, marine fish as well as uh, freshwater, are no longer edible or safe. You have to eat them in very limited amounts because of the accumulation of these heavy metals from coal. Now, they don't pay the cost of that. How much autism and brain damage has been caused, which is on the increase significantly, by these heavy metals. Nobody pays, the taxpayers pay the cost of that, not the source, not the fossil fuel industry. What about asthma? How much asthma due to fine particulates, aerosols, due to fossil fuels, on the increase again, they pay none of the cost of that. They pay none of the negative health impacts 
that their fuels cause. So they're getting off free. We're not only subsidizing them by uh, subsidizing their exploration, we're also subsidizing them by not charging them for these negative impacts. And perhaps greatest of all now, climate change. They're not paying any costs for that. The big reinsurance companies will tell you it's very clear that over recent decades, the intensity and frequency of severe storms has increased dramatically. It's on a totally different slope. Hundreds of billions of dollars and countless deaths. Who pays for that? We do. They bear none of the cost. So one of the reasons fossil fuels are still cheap and alternative energy such as renewables can't compete in price is that they're not being charged for the negative impacts that they cause. They're getting a free ride. And this must be factored into any assessment of the relative value, any assessment that has a moral dimension of the relative value of fossil fuels versus, say, renewable energy. Those are my comments. <clears throat> Actually, uh, George, I, I always love our conversations and maybe just a, uh, some comments on that. Uh, on the issue of uh, the different technologies and, and how we actually make these selections, um, as an engineer, I, I have to divorce myself from my preconceived notions about the validity of a given technology, and I have to really look at it for what it is in and of itself. It's a tool. Uh, and my job is to ma match the right tool to the right problem because that's how we're, we're going to find that kind of mutual benefit of both the financial and the environmental impact. Uh, what that means sometimes is, is extremely viable technologies in one place, um, such as some of the renewables, are not viable. They're not good fits other places. doesn't mean it's not a good tool. It just means that it's not always the best fit. And we have to separate from that and really look to see where are our best opportunities. Um, and when it comes to the bigger picture of oil, I 100% agree with a lot of these impacts, especially when we're talking about externalities. Uh, but from a business perspective, the issue of oil and fossil fuels also bears a very unique and significant risk. And as a business person, I always have to be considerate of that risk as I'm looking at changing or diversifying our energy portfolio. Um, that risk is really unique to the fossil fuel industry because I don't know of many people, fossil fuel industry including, that will argue that it is an infinitely renewable resource. Um, it is a limited resource. So we've seen over the years that that resource continues to increase. We've seen and, and uh, garnered a better and better understanding of what the impact is of that consumption, especially the burning of that fossil fuel. Hence, more realization of the, essentially, the real cost of these types of things and the actual and tangible risk and liability that's associated with them. So there is a drive away from a number of these fossil fuel sources. It's not that we step away from them altogether. It's not that we justify or we um, uh, argue with or use the fact that they are highly ingrained in a lot of these uh, governmental circles as an excuse not to do different. Uh, if anything, we want to factor in those liabilities to make better and more informed decisions that are based upon science. They're based upon math. They're uh, based upon real and legitimate factors that are unique and, and, and important to each uh, installation we do. So, and again, that, my soapbox. Thank you all for a delightful plenary session. Um, please um, join me in thanking our, our speakers. There are some great talks. College Place is a video library of noteworthy presentations, panel discussions, and lectures featuring guest speakers and faculty members taped at one of the Milwaukee Area Technical College's four southeastern Wisconsin campuses. These are produced by students in the college's associate's degree program in television video production in coordination with Milwaukee Public Television.